how are you doing today? Are you excited for this talk? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Good to uh, talk about what we've got. So yeah, good. that's good. I'm sure everybody is watching along. We got 38 people watching us, so I'm gonna shut up and leave you to it, and I'll pop back up in 10 minutes to host some questions from the audience. Everybody watching, remember to keep them coming in on the Q&A tab. Thomas, it is over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so uh, hi, my name's Tom. I'm the CEO of Sequoia, and I'm gonna give you a quick overview of uh, what we've been doing for the past few years, why we're doing it, and where we want to take it as well. So. So I just wanted to start with a company mission. It's to accelerate the adoption of smart sustainable infrastructure. And the reason for this is because there, we believe there's a lot of data in the world that isn't being used to improve society in the right way. So if we can access that data and use it in the right way, we believe that we can help make quite a big difference to the economy and improve people's lives. So, that, so that's the main motivation for everything. So. Um, the strategy we've decided to take to achieve this is to create a platform that can gather vast amounts of data from its environment, all the while staying secure and easily scalable as well, because that's a big factor in, with this technology. And uh, the technology we believe will play the key part in creating this platform is Vision AI. Uh, combining this with edge computing, Internet of Things technologies and automation, we believe we can create a system that has many applications across many industries and improves with scale. So it's an exponential growth uh, technology. So why did we go for vision AI predominantly? Well, vision is used in a multitude of different industries, mainly because as humans, it's our primary sense that we use when designing our infrastructure. Uh, the Vision AI is capitalized on uh, the Vision AI industry is capitalized on this and is growing quite rapidly from autonomous vehicles to Perseverance landing on Mars. You know, uh, both use cameras, so Perseverance using them to localize itself and, and make sure it lands in the right place, and autonomous vehicles to make sure they don't run over people. So uh, the scope for growth is quite huge with reducing costs of hardware, improve, improve resolutions, and with the use of AI. We have the potential to mimic, if not improve upon, what we as humans can do with vision ourselves. So ultimately, the world we live in is built on vision. It's our primary sense. So it makes, you know, it seems reasonable to build a system that can extract the data using the sensor that we've uh, evolved to value the most. So that's the logic there. So in order to make vision work as a means of data acquisition, we've concluded that there are some key technology principles that need to be developed. Having the capability to map an environment in three dimensions, the ability to distinguish between static, and, like a uh, static environment like walls, bushes, trees, things like that, and dynamic objects of interest like people, cars, and UAVs, as I'll get onto in a second. We then want to localize these objects in 3D, in a 3D mapped environment, and then track them both in space and time. And what comes with all of these technologies is the ability to detect depth consistently and at varying distances and with uh, increasing accuracies with new technologies. So when it comes to detecting depth with vision, there are a few technologies that can be used with various pros and cons. And this is just a brief overview of the technologies we've considered. Um, most, if you're, in, if you're quite technical, you'll know you've heard of a lot of these. Um, but I don't want to go into too much detail, uh, but the results ultimately show uh, that stereo vision may not perform the best in each category for this these type of applications, but it does provide us with the broadest coverage. It gives us the ability to create valuable products in the short term and has the most potential for improvement over time because it's so uh, well used. Uh, the other technology that plays a huge role in achieving this mission is edge computing. Uh, typically, AI algorithms have been run on large server farms, which if we relate to CCTV or, or uh, uh, would receive images from the cameras in the field, process them, and then send the data to uh, the relevant application, which would then make sense of that data. Uh, unknowns in AI up till now have meant that a brute force approach was the go-to solution for improving accuracy. So you just keep, keep adding processing power and making the neural net bigger. However, when it comes to uh, large camera networks, 
uh, you have security issues and you know ethical issues and we all know about that stuff um and uh, yeah and but with an edge computing platform you get bandwidth and latency improvements uh, because with a cloud solution you're having to transmit these images and there's huge amounts of data being used so with an edge solution you put the neural net that runs on the cloud uh, server and you put that inside the camera itself or inside the node and uh, doing this means that information sent from the camera to the server is is just stuff like object location or person dog cat car uav sort of thing that's the only stuff that's sent over that connection which drastically improves speed uh, latency and, and data bandwidth as well um, our initial calculations as you can see on the screen you know show 270,000 times less data being sent across this connection and that that'll only go up with more with higher resolutions and and things like that and uh, so this dramatically improves bandwidth latency and improves the security as well as no images are actually being sent so there's no feed to tap into so the useful data is processed and dumped before anything actually leaves the camera it's useful to anybody else um, scalability is increased as well as we don't have to worry about growing the server farm as 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 much as most of the heavy lifting is done at the edge so we just grow our platform as as we would anyway and although it does limit our processing capability we have proven that hardware available today combined with optimized software can achieve the performance level that we need to make a product valuable and the uh, uh, valuable today and the business profitable as well so that's that's a benefit <laughs> So in order to prove this technology uh, has value, we need to use, we need end user applications, obviously. So we've had interest for the development of UAV detection. So uh, yeah, UAV detection and tracking as well, and UAV environment reconnaissance. Uh, both of these push the technology's capabilities to, to the extreme, which is good because when it comes to implementing new, less intense applications in the future, we will have developed that technology to a point where it should be capable of running them. And just so to give you an idea of what we've got so far, on the left is a mock-up of the, the camera that we've got. You can see the stereo vision. And on the right is the module that we're using to run these neural nets and everything uh, in real time. Um, it's, it's crazy how small they're getting, and this is making it a reality. Uh, and this is just to show you what uh, we're capable of doing. This is something we would uh, approach with a while ago. It's an office optimization application, which we uh, uh, have been have developed for them. And uh, since then, we've improved the capabilities quite dramatically, but this is, uh, this is what we've got out there. Uh, it, this is all running in real time. This was all recorded on uh, with the algorithms running on the edge device in real time. And then we just recorded it and made it nice and pretty. Um, yeah, you can see the top left, it's localizing and tracking the, the people. Uh, we just put some boxes in for the stuff around there. You can then, uh, you have object occupancy on the top right. And then at the bottom, you've got like a time-based map, uh, heat map of the usage of the area. So um, with UAV detection, the main three factors are detecting, localizing, and tracking the desired objects uh, with uh, and we have a strategy to increase both range and accuracy over the next 12 months, working with the CDC and, uh, uh, and then get it out to clients and customers to start proving the product works in the real world applications and making sure it tests well. So, so yeah, so that's everything that I've got for the presentation. Uh, any questions? And I'll be happy to answer. I think before we get to questions, we need to give you a round of applause, Thomas. That was amazing. I'm still not convinced that everybody's joining me with these round of applauses. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a slew of questions come in, so I'm going to jump oh, wow. into it because we haven't got much time. One comes from Tony, and I think this may be a leading question, and you'll find out why in his session. Are you hosting this in Cornwall? Uh, yeah, that would be the intention. We, uh, we've had a few applications, uh, or uh, a few, we've been approached by a couple of people uh, with regards to uh, tracking uh, drones um, and so we're developing the capability of doing that 
Um, there are challenges, as I explained there, that uh, drones can be very small <laughs> and you're looking in a very blue, potentially gray sky. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, you know, there's some re really uh, important software that we need to develop uh, further to make sure that we can do it reliably and consistently over time. Um, so we're not giving false positives, you know, here's a drone, it's actually a bird or, or a plane, oh no, Superman sort of thing. Um, but no, it's, uh, uh, yeah, we're just uh, getting that accuracy up and, and getting it working properly. But yeah, we've, we've got interest in that and that's what we're going to be focusing on going forward in the next 12 months. Awesome. I think you should have a conversation with Tony about hosting. Uh, he might be the right person to talk to. And mm -hmm. um, we've had a question come in from Brian. Vision systems have limitations, mm -hmm. especially in the resolution of images. Mm -hmm. How does this affect your cost model? Yeah, so uh, with your typical um, your typical cameras that work in the visual spectrum, um, the the logic really is that we most most of our infrastructure has been built with with those wavelengths, and um, the resolution is is very important. And this is where moving everything to the edge is plays plays a more significant role. Because if you're trying to transmit those images over a, over a network, you're either going to get clogged up or you just get huge latency issues. Um, we need the resolution to improve accuracy, especially when you're improving the range capabilities as well. Uh, when you move it to the edge, you then have the issue of uh, processing power. But with uh, software optimizations, which is where our focus has been, we've managed to uh, develop software that can use higher resolutions without impacting the the frame rate or anything so uh, in, impacting the the the, val the core value of, of the information so um this is something we we've, we've been able to reach quite good ranges up till now um with increased uh, resolutions and using our optimized software we think we could definitely get to uh, up to the 100 meters if not further uh, with testing as well um, and also with our network capabilities so that the, they're not just going to be standalone we can have multiple all communicating with each other and making uh, probability decisions um, on that information as well so all of this would come together to map an environment localize the objects in that environment and then give the relevant data to that company that's using it so i hope that answered your question Excellent. Um, I highly recommend you link up with Brian, by the way. Um, I think he might might have some uh, good ideas for you. Um, we've only got one minute left, so this is going to be a very quick question. Sure. Um, and I love this one because it shows that conference-driven development is still alive in our digital world. How do you fancy putting one of your cameras on the moon? Sure. Why not? We were, we were just talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you just, as you, as you do. just saying, um, yeah. You can use this uh, to localize uh, and put it on a moving object potentially. There's quite a few uh, uh, companies developing that out there, putting them on drones and mapping areas. Completely possible doing that. Um, you could walk around with it. You could sit it in a sit it in a static location. And this is partly one of our big ones: is that you can sit it down. It will map the area and then just start localizing things in that area. And even if something comes in and parks in front of you it will then say, this is a static object now, it's not moving. So uh, I need to account for that in, in my um, tracking of things. So it, it's dynamic and static environment mapping that's a big part in this as well. So, sorry, yeah. Excellent, as long as it's not within 10 kilometers of an Apollo moon landing site, because apparently you're <laughs> not allowed to do that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Thomas, it has been an absolute pleasure to host you. I wish we could dive into more about this. It's a super interesting topic. Um, our next session comes from Tony uh, from Builder. So everybody watching along, if you want to drop out of this one and head over to the other session, and I will see you there. Thomas, once again, thank you very much for your talk. Nothing. See you again. See you.